I'm going to touch a little bit in this presentation uh, on my background and about the substantive sort of uh, topic of this whole forum, which is about getting your foot in the door or succeeding in the music industry. Um, but I'm, I'm largely going to cover a more substantive legal issue uh, as pertains to the changing nature of the business itself, which I think will help at least give a backdrop uh, for an industry that you want to enter into, if that is indeed what you want, which I assume is the case. That's why you're here. Um, a lot of my personal background, Deborah already touched on. I had been asked by uh, my host to provide some of that information. And I realized this morning that my presentation was way too long, so Deborah just saved me by telling you a bunch of stuff about my background. Very well done. So, yeah, I saw a Beatles movie. It made me want to be a drummer. I was eight years old. Convinced my parents. Lobbied really hard for about a year. They finally decided to let me take drum lessons. It worked really well. I met a guy named Sean Burrow who became the singer for my band, uh, which is still the band I'm uh, currently doing what I do vis-a-vis -vis music. Uh, you know about the undergrad, went to law school, I've been a full-time musician. It let me experience a whole bunch of things in the industry, which I think touches on a really important point I'd like to uh, relate to you, which uh, uh, Windsorite, are people from Windsor called Windsorites or Windsorians? Windsorites? I'm going to go Windsorian just to be a contrarian. Uh, a well-known Windsorian named Gordy Johnson once gave me a really good piece of advice. He said, if you want to make it in the music industry, you have to have your foot in a bunch of different um, areas within that industry. You can't rely on one thing. If you do, you're doomed to have a very tough life. Uh, so the role uh, with Widemouth Mason where in uh, essentially I was helping manage, uh, tour manage, doing production work, uh, dealing with the legal stuff more recently, um, has kind of been uh, me fulfilling that uh, suggestion by Gordy. And I would pass that along to anyone who wants to do anything in the music biz or entertainment uh, industry in general. Um, learn as much as you can about as many areas and facets of the industry as you can. And uh, if you can't be an expert in all of those facets, try to look like you're an expert in all of those facets. Um, in terms of my legal uh, law practice history and, uh, law and ed law legal education, uh, we decided to take a bit of a hiatus with the band. The other two guys focused on, law s on uh, music and I decided to go to law school because I thought it would be a good way to kill time. Uh, I never really intended to practice law, to be totally frank with you. Um, but you know, when you're in law school, you see everybody going for their second year articles and planning their career. And most people seem to have it really together when they're in law school. And I didn't feel that way. I kind of felt like I was just a punter there to hang out. Um, that's not to say I didn't want to learn. That's, that was the real crux of uh, my decision to go to law school. Anyway, suffice it to say, uh, I realized partway through that I should probably, if I'm going to run this marathon, I should probably see it through to the end. So I ended up uh, you know, doing my bar ad admission, getting called to the bar. Uh, and then I, I got to a point where I didn't really know what to do because I had made a promise to my bandmates that after law school we would focus on music again. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to let the, the potential career in uh, the legal side of things go away. So I figured the best route to go was to hang up my own shingle, which is what law students and lawyers say when they start their own practice. Uh, so I started my own practice in copyright, music, and entertainment law. Uh, and that kind of let me have the flexibility to still be a musician uh, as often as I wanted to be. Um, so I'm still in Wyoming with Mason. I'm still uh, in my practice, uh, sort of complements that and vice versa. Uh, the practice largely deals with uh, contracts. That's really the bulk of what goes on in entertainment law. Um, everything from distribution deals to publishing deals, um, to licensing, band partnership agreements, and basically contracts are really central to entertainment law. Um, so for those of you in law school, make sure you remember your contract law course, if and when you want to become a music lawyer or entertainment lawyer. Uh, I also deal with things like copyright registration, trademark registration, um, what else? label shopping from time to time, advice about business structures. But you know what I think is probably the bulk of what I do? It's not necessarily legal. Uh, it's more on the business side of things. It's giving advice to people who want to do something in the, in the industry, uh, musicians often or artists generally who want to try and forge a career uh, in an industry that's admittedly sometimes a difficult one to sort of get your foot in the door of. Um, so I was asked to give some advice 
I think this relates to the sort of broader topic of this forum. Some advice about getting a career in this field uh, or the music business in general. A lot of this stuff's kind of obvious. Uh, I kind of tried to look at it from a few different perspectives. <coughs> One being if you want to be on the sort of management or uh, legal side of things, the more I guess the administrative side of things, which is a great way to enter into the business and has a lot more security than if you're trying to be an artist. Um, and you know, I'm going to say network, and I know you hear that in every industry, every field, from anyone who has any experience in anything, they say network, uh, which is a bit of, you know, been there, done that sort of thing. Everyone knows you need to network to do something. Um, but the reason for that is because it's important. It's important to know people, it's important to interact with people, um, if for nothing else than just to have a shared sense of what's out there and a shared uh, knowledge base and, and some kind of exposure to opportunities that present themselves. Because opportunities often present themselves out of nowhere and, uh, and if you want to take advantage of them you need to be aware of them and how you're aware of them is by knowing people. Um, there's tons of different ways you can network, volunteering, you know, I know for example the Juno Awards have a large volunteer core that uh, helps them run the, the award show and the festival that surrounds it. They always are looking for people to participate. There's artist legal clinics, I know there's one in Toronto, I know there's one in Montreal, I think there's one about to open in Ottawa. Um, so those are great places to at least get exposure to the ins and outs of, of dealing with the law, the cross-section of law and art. Uh, attending concerts, you know, book shows, uh, gallery launches, anything like that where you're exposed to artists. Um, artists generally, and I'm, I'm uh, generalizing quite a bit here, it's a blanket statement, but artists often are focused on their craft. Um, and sometimes that means they're not so focused on the administrative side of things, the business side of things, um, the marketing side of things. So if someone can provide them with assistance, most of them are very happy to take it. Um, and that's where, again, if you want to enter via this route, uh, that's a great niche and void to fill for artists. You need to find artists, first of all, that, uh, that you believe in and that you think you can have a good working relationship with. Uh, and you do that by going to the events I mentioned. You can also look for mentors uh, and just helpful people in the industry. I've been consistently surprised by how helpful both lawyers in the industry are and just people who've been in the industry a long time um, are, and they're, and they're always willing to sort of offer advice or, or at least lend an ear. Um, so take advantage of that. You know, that's a, it's a great way to learn and, again, be aware of ideas and opportunities that are out there. Um, internships are also a great route to go. Sometimes there are pre-existing internships that you can find. Um, in some cases, you can create your own internship, internship if you're convincing enough. Um, and you can look to, a lot of times indie labels will, will be open to those ideas, collective rights societies like SOCAN, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so that's sort of the business uh, and law sort of side. If you are an artist or a musician, and you're looking for a, a way to sort of get your foot in the door, uh, that's, a, that's a tougher question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you the advice that I give a lot of clients um, or just people, you know, having general conversations with me about this. And that is, if you want a long-term career uh, as an artist, uh, you need to take a long-term strategy, which means you're going to invest a lot of time and effort into building your brand. Um, and the starting point for that is building something of quality. Now, that's subjective, as all art is subjective. Um, but if you build something that has integrity, that truly represents who and what you are, um, and that you believe in, then other people will get that. I don't know how many, but some will. Um, and that's something that you can then build on. Uh, a really good long-term strategy I've found is to think of it in local or regional terms. If you can build up a regional following, a local following, that'll give you the foundation um, from which you can then try to incrementally spread out. Um, and I know that doesn't sound as glamorous as just write a hit song and become world famous, but uh, that's a really difficult route to go, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm advising you that this is probably a safer bet. But again, as a lawyer, I need to say there are no guarantees. I'm just suggesting to you what uh, I think are positive routes. Uh, and then finally, for everyone, regardless of what you're doing, um, I think if you're innovative, you can, uh, there's room for you. There's always room for innovators. And the industry, as I'm going to touch on uh, in the substantive section of this presentation, is really in a period of flux, it's really in a period of transition. Uh, and so people who sort of have a pulse of, of what's going on in terms of the minds of the general public, um, you really have an advantage. So, so if you feel like you're hip to that, then, uh, then use that, figure out how you can exploit that. 
because uh, there's room for you. All right, let's get to the substantive part. I'm going to move around a bit because I feel weird turning around all the time while I'm looking at this. So tell me if I'm not loud enough, and I'll go back to the mic. Um, so the substantive part of, of this presentation deals with the changing face of distribution uh, of creative content, creative content being movies, music, anything like that. Um, with the internet, the wonderful internet, uh, came a massive shift in distribution conduits uh, because things got digitized. So before the internet, uh, big content owners, those are the, you know, multinational companies that have control of or own uh, content, like major labels or Hollywood corporations and on and on. I'm going to refer to them as big content from here forward, just because I can't think of a catchier phrase. And saying the whole big content owner, major labels, Hollywood thing is, gets a bit unwieldy. So let's call them big content. Uh, effectively, they had an oligopoly on distribution. So there was just a handful of them, and they were chiefly responsible for distribution, and nobody else really had an inroads into that. Um, they would farm some of that work out. There would be other people uh, on the periphery, but really the bulk of stuff that was getting put out there was being controlled by big content. Um, and that started to be threatened because the internet came along. And the internet made it so that distribution wasn't limited to physical product. Distribution all of a sudden became things like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing um, or streaming of material, uh, stuff that big content didn't control. Oops. So the last 10 to 12 years, we've seen two major trends that, uh, that uh, have dominated uh, the music industry. One of them is this shift in consumer preferences from CDs to peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, uh, downloading of streaming, downloading of uh, online content. Um, and the second trend is a diminishing revenue uh, base for the major labels, which resulted in really, really heavy and severe contraction by those major labels, where you saw massive layoffs, massive uh, cutbacks to budgets, um, which meant fewer artists were signed, which meant less money was put into developing those artists and marketing those artists. Uh, and it also saw the merging of the major labels. So 12 years ago, there were five major labels. Right now, there's four. And it looks like there's going to be three really soon. Uh, so there were some studies that were done through the last, I think, 10, 12 years, 10 years, 8 years maybe, uh, that suggested there's actually no link between file sharing and those diminishing revenues and CD sales. Um, that idea was, uh, was, uh, didn't sit well with big content, didn't sit well with the major labels. A group called CREA, which is the Canadian Record Industry Association, and its sister or parent sister group, I guess, in the States called RIA, the Recording Industry Association of America, uh, vehemently claimed that the two trends are linked. In other words, that file sharing is the cause and the effect is uh, massive losses for not only major labels but the music industry in general. So faced with that threat to their profits, what was the reaction of uh, the major labels? They essentially resisted. They wanted to hold on to the old model that they had, uh, which ha saw massive profits for them, massive. Uh, so this resistance strategy essentially com consisted of litigation, suing people or suing ISPs, internet service providers, uh, basically suing anyone they, could, they thought they had a chance to either scare or win against. Uh, it involved digital locks, which are part and parcel of a bigger concept called technical protection measures, or TPMs. So these are things that are embedded into your content, your digital content, that dictate how you can interact with that content. So for example, if you buy a song from iTunes and you can only use it on Apple uh, hardware, or you can only copy it a certain number of times, that's an example of technical protection measures or digital locks. Uh, another facet of the strategy was lobbying for, for stronger anti-circumvention laws. Now I'm going to get into anti-circumvention laws. That's uh, sort of a major theme of what I'm going to talk about very soon. So we'll leave it at that. But suffice it to say, it deals with changing copyright law. Uh, and the final component was guilt and scare tactics. So you saw in the States especially, a lot of the major labels would send out letters to those people they thought were infringing, saying, you've infringed by downloading X number of songs. We're going to sue you for some ungodly amount. But if you're willing to pay us $500 or $1,000 or $5,000, it was arbitrary, I think, uh, then we won't sue you. And then you're good for those songs that we claim you've downloaded. Uh, and a lot of people got scared into paying that money. An interesting side note, 
nobody actually knows where that money went other than into the record label's bank accounts. The artists whose songs were getting traded, they didn't see that money. It was never contemplated in the contracts they signed, and still isn't. Uh, I should also mention that uh, this attitude of resisting change, this wasn't the first time that it happened. When blank audio cassettes came out, when blank recordable CDs came out, the major labels had a very similar reaction. The only difference is they were quick to turn around on, in both of those instances and embrace the technology. Um, so much so that with CDs, for example, the music industry saw its greatest boom period in its history uh, in terms of, of, music, of money from uh, music sales. Because think about it, everyone who had cassettes or their A-tracks or their vinyl wanted to get, had to restock, you know, let's say their Led Zeppelin collection or their Etta James collection or whatever it was, they had to go rebuy it on CD. So that meant huge sales in addition to all the new stuff that was coming out on CD. But for whatever reason, the major labels didn't embrace the same, uh, the same, I same attitude vis-a-vis peer-to-peer file sharing. And I think the reason for that is, because I don't think they fully understand it, I don't think they fully understood how pervasive it is and the reason why it exists. Again, we're going to get into some of this stuff. So let's look at one uh, facet of that strategy, the lobbying for uh, anti-circumvention laws. Um, so big content essentially goes out and pushes for massive policy changes. In 1998, they succeeded by having uh, something called the DMCA uh, enacted into law in the United States. The DMCA is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, I'm going to get into this quite a bit in a little bit, so just keep that in the back of your head. Uh, they also very recently lobbied for something called, uh, two bills called SOPA and PIPA, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. If you haven't, just read those bits uh, of information right there and I'll tell you what they're about. In a nutshell, they essentially attempt to give rights holders uh, longer and sharper claws, uh, essentially meant to create a bigger net to catch infringers and to punish those infringers. All of this is geared towards re-establishing or reinforcing the old model, which was one of dominance by big content. Uh, I read an interesting article just a few days ago in the Globe and Mail by Andrew Steele. It's called Stephen Harper and the New Politics of Consumerism. And the reason it's interesting is because it talks about how we can look at, if we so choose, uh, public policy decisions through the lens of consumers versus producers. That many decisions are based on, the, on, on regulating the tension between those two. And that's what government's role is. Uh, the article posits that usually consumers aren't well informed about a given area of, of production. Because you know, we're all consumers, we have lives to live. You know, we have jobs, we have to put food on the table. We don't have time to sit and study, well, how is this going to impact my life? Um, whereas people who produce or, or in the production industry are well informed about their area because that's what they go and do at their job. Uh, so the result is that the more informed group uh, i.e. the producers, often wins. So policy outcomes often favor them. But this wasn't the case with SOPA and PIPA. Uh, and I think that's because uh, of something I'm going to get into in a little bit, which is just consumer savviness and uh, a sense of consumer alienation. So anyway, uh, like I said, big content lobbies hard for these two bills. Consumers responded with a really loud voice, and it was loud enough to stop those bills in their tracks. We'll see how long that lasts, but that's where we're at right now. Um, all of this is under the umbrella of copyright law. That's what we're really talking about here. These are attempts to change copyright law and change its nature. There's a long quote here by a guy who was uh, a Supreme Court uh, uh, justice in Canada named Ian Binney. You can read it if you like. It's, uh, it's, a, it's from a case called The Berge, and it's a, a really important sort of piece in, uh, in sort of rationalizing uh, or explaining why copyright law exists. Essentially though, this is what it means, if you want to boil it down to its essence. It means that copyright is a balance. It's a balance between two interests. On the one hand, you have the public interest, uh, the, sometimes referred to as a public domain. Um, and to serve this interest, copyright should ensure that artistic and literary works are available for public consumption, because it's good for people to have artistic and literary works available to them. Uh, the second interest is the creator side, which ensures, which copyright uh, seeks to ensure uh, that there's a reward system in place for creators, for their efforts, to encourage them to create works. You should note uh, these two things basically feed on each other. So 
When you reward creators, they create more stuff. And when there's more stuff out there available to the public, more people create stuff. Um, so it's kind of a feedback loop, which when the proper balance is struck is a lovely thing. Uh, so until the late 90s, basically before DMCA, uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, remember we touched on it earlier, uh, copyright essentially dealt with one major issue, and that was ensuring that only content creators or whoever they sold their rights to uh, were able to copy that work. Uh, in other words, were able to exploit that work. So if no one else can copy your work, they can't exploit it. If you can copy your work, you can exploit it. Um, or you can sell it to someone else, sell your rights to someone else, and they can copy it and exploit it. That was it. That was what it was all about. The DMCA changed that because it introduced what I referred to earlier, anti-circumvention measures, uh, which essentially are something, a mechanism wherein it makes it illegal to break a lock, for example. So remember the example of the iTunes song that you bought that you can only do certain things with? If you find a way to break that lock, to circumvent it, uh, you can then do things with it. Sometimes legitimate things, like let's say you want to make multiple copies of it to store on your backup hard drive and other devices that you use to listen to music in case something crashes, whatever. Uh, in copyright law, you're allowed to do that. That's, it's called uh, private copying. When you do something for private copying or private use, it's legitimate. However, because of anti-circumvention laws, if you break the lock, that in and of itself is an infringing act. So doing something for a legitimate purpose becomes illegitimate when you break a lock. Again, this gives control back to big content this, or to the rights holder. Whoever's choosing to use the lock can essentially dictate to you how you get to interact with that content. So think if, if you went to a pizza place, you wanted to buy a pizza, and the pizza guy said, you know what, I can, you can only eat it in this amount of time, and you can't share it with anybody else, you can only eat it yourself. Doesn't seem on its face to make any sense, right? When you buy something, the assumption is that you get to do with it what you want, so long as you're not hurting anybody. And I guess that's the crux of this argument. Who gets hurt? Does anyone get hurt? Uh, so the circumvention measures in the DMCA were punishable through really stiff penalties. You guys might have heard of cases that came up in the States where some grandmother got sued for hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think because her grandchild had downloaded 12 songs or something. And there was a case of a mother, I think, in Minnesota, same thing happened, where you're seeing, un again, crazy amounts of money for downloading some songs. Uh, the DMCA effectively set up a framework where they encourage rights holders and they encourage big content to use locks, to use technical protection measures, and to sue when those technical protection measures were circumvented. Um, it also provides, because 12 years later, we have a whole body of uh, evidence to see how, what impact it had, so it provides a very stark illustration that uh, circumvention laws don't work. You know, the goal was to curtail file sharing. Has file sharing been curtailed? No, it's the same as it was, if not even, even more dominant. Uh, and was, did it save the industry? Did it save major labels? It did not. Those in, major labels are still going through the exact same problems they were going through before. In fact, those problems are amplified. Um, and on a side note, it also opened up copyright to areas of jurisdiction that copyright had no business being in. For example, patent law. Uh, if there aren't any law students or lawyers in the room, and even if they're not, it's, it's, you know, this is common sense. When you have er competing areas of law dealing with the same, same substance, it's confusing. So how can you expect people in society to live according to the law if they don't know what the law is or if two laws are contradictory? It just doesn't make sense on its face. Uh, by the way, that, I'm cutting this short because I know I'm going to be over. So if you want to get into that, I'll be around for most of the day. We can talk about it. I'll give you the example of the generic car door openers. It's interesting if you're into interesting uh, legal cases in the States. Um, so that was in the States. In Canada, we've seen attempts to reform copyright for 10 years. There have been a number of bills tabled. The most recent is Bill C-11. And the last two, including C-11, both include anti-circumvention clauses. This is despite the fact that we have a, an ample body of evidence from the DMCA that shows us it doesn't work, it doesn't achieve the goals that it says it's trying to achieve. Um, and not only that, it actually creates more problems. It creates more uh, adverse situations. For example, here are two negative impacts that stem from using uh, or from having anti-circumvention laws and the encouragement of that digital lock and litigation approach. Uh, one is consumer alienation and the other is anti-competitiveness. Let's talk about consumer alienation. 
So the supporters of anti-circumvention laws say it's meant to deter people from file sharing, it's meant to deter people from illegal copying. And, and the reason for that is just by dint of these three points. One, that the existence of the law itself will deter some people. So people in society, if they know there's a law against jaywalking, some people will not jaywalk because they know that that law exists. Uh, the second component is the threat of litigation. So maybe they'll still jaywalk, but if they see a cop there, they won't jaywalk. Or if they see someone else or have a friend that got caught jaywalking, maybe for a few days they won't jaywalk. And the third is actual litigation. So they get caught jaywalking. Or uh, someone they know gets caught jaywalking right beside them. So those are three sort of components that led uh, supporters to say this is a deterrent, it's going to work. As I said before, it didn't in the States. So why didn't it work? I'm going to posit that it didn't work for these two reasons. The DMCA did not account for, and generally the big content sort of approach to this issue, didn't account for consumer preferences and didn't account for consumer savviness. It didn't count, account for the, mind of the, general, the minds of the general public. Consumer preferences uh, again, deal with, this is how people want their content. It's easy, it's convenient, it suits their lifestyle. So give that to them. But rather than embracing the file sharing approach, rather than monetizing it, uh, the DMCA and, uh, and the general push by big content was to say, no, we're going to create a punitive model, a model that punishes people for wanting to do and interact with, uh, with the content the way that they want to interact with it. Um, by the way, again, if you want to talk about this afterwards, come ask me about the Songwriters Association of Canada proposal. It is a suggestion for how we can actually monetize peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and uh, inject a whole bunch of, of uh, money uh, into a system that's you know, really failing miserably. Um, and the second point I was going to make for uh, what the DMCA didn't account for was consumer savviness. I think consumers are a lot more hip to what's going on than they were 20 years ago. Part of that is because of the internet. Part of that is just because as a society we grow and learn and have shared experiences and we all grow from that. Um, but people are definitely more hip to what goes on behind the scenes. People are hip to the idea, artists for a long time have been saying, you know, the major labels are ripping us off and people are attuned to that. Um, there, was a, there was something called the Sony uh, Rootkit case in the early 2000s where Sony was putting on their CDs uh, they were embedding this, uh, this software that essentially would, would surreptitiously go on your computer. When you bought a CD and you put it in your computer, it would, it would upload all this stuff, including a music player. So you had to play that CD on that music player. Uh, and, and this is without telling the consumer this. And the, the real crux of it was that it would also send back information to some black ops Sony headquarters, which I don't know where it is, telling Sony what was going on, what the consumer was doing, what they were listening to, what their preferences were, essentially spying on them. They lost that case in court. Uh, but it really opened people's eyes to what was going on and how dangerous TPMs can be. Um, so right, consumer alienation. We, we've kind of been over this, but just to sum summarize that. Rather than deter file sharing, uh, anti-circumvention laws essentially alienate consumers, and that's a disincentive to pur purchase music and it legitimizes things like file sharing and in fact entrenches those things. And consumer alienation is bad. It's bad because it means people are hostile towards the industry. Uh, it mean, it's bad because there's less money coming in. When there's less money coming in, whether it's to big content or otherwise, there's less money being put into developing acts. There's, less, there's fewer acts signed. There's less money put into developing the infrastructure of the industry. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the, the consumer alienation that ends up in consumer hostility at the extreme end, uh, is, it's tough for consumers to target it because you don't always know who is in bed and who isn't in bed with the major labels. So while people are hip to, you know, let's say the Sony rootkit thing, they don't always know who is directly signed as a Sony uh, artist or not uh, due to the nature of distribution deals either via indie uh, labels or via artists to the major label directly. Um, basically, all that's kind of a... a a mangled way of saying, it's not always easy for a mad consumer to say, well, I'm not going to support this label because they did this, or I'm not going to support major labels because they do this, and I'm going to do that by not buying such and such artist music. Well, it may actually be that that artist isn't in bed with that label, they just use that label as a service provider for distribution. Uh, okay, the second adverse effect that, uh, that I had mentioned was anti-competitiveness. So, again, the old model saw big content in this really dominant position. Uh, they had an oligopoly. 
the anti-circumvention laws, and that starts to change with the internet, the anti-circumvention laws are a pushback. They're an attempt to ensure that, that rights holders, which are mostly big content, not all, but mostly, uh, it's an attempt to ensure that they still have that control, that they can still dictate to the consumer how they interact with the content, um, even after the point of sale. So effectively, they reinforce the disproportionate power relationships between big content and the consumers, and big content and artists. And that's a bad thing, because that essentially means you're in an anti-competitive uh, industry. And anti-competitive industries aren't good for anyone except for the people who are owners of the monopoly. So I think I've done well on time. I hope I have. Uh, in summary, this is basically what I've been talking about, right? Supporters of anti-circumvention say P, uh, rights holders should have the choice to use digital locks and things like that. And they should have laws, strong laws, that support them in, the, in that choice should they choose to go that route. The counter argument is that laws that support the use of TPMs, encourage the use of TPMs, means that TPMs will be used, means that litigation will be used. And that's not good because it creates consumer alienation, it creates hostility, uh, and it creates just a discord. It's just basic general common sense. If you're in business, you don't want to make your customers angry. You don't want to make your customers unhappy with you. You don't want to have fights with your customers. It probably doesn't serve your, uh, your greater goal of trying to make money off of those people. So sort of stepping back and being a little bit more macro about this, because big content was slow to react and still is slow to react uh, in terms of there's still no discussions of monetizing peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, uh, I happen to know that the Songwriters Association, which I touched on earlier, uh, has put a proposal out and they've, and they've put a ton of work into sifting through it, they've modified it, they've tried to, to account for uh, all the criticisms of it, and they've taken it to big content. And for the most part, big content is, is very hostile towards it. I'm not completely sure why, I think maybe big content thinks they can still get back to the glory days. Um, but if your ship is sinking, you know, if someone's offering you some kind of salve, you'd think you would jump on board. Maybe it'll happen. Um, but what that means for people in this room and others who are interested in this industry um, is that there's a shift in the balance of powers. You're seeing, like I said, the major labels contract. You're seeing acts that can, that can make it, be it in music or other areas, without necessarily the help of major labels. And that's a good thing. That means more people have a chance. Um, and so what that means for people who want to get into the industry is if you can, again, touched on this earlier, if you can figure out what's going on, if you can figure out what it is that people want and how they want it, and you can figure out a way to uh, tap into that and exploit it, you're in such an advantageous position. Um, I give the example of iTunes, even though I kind of slagged them a little bit earlier. Uh, in many ways, they're one of the most innovative things that's happened in the music industry in the last 12 years. They were uh, essentially a company, Apple, that uh, made products, right, made hardware made iPods, made computers, whatever else. They had no foothold whatsoever in the business of distributing music. They brought in the iTunes store. Major labels did not give a reasonable alternative to that. And so the result is that iTunes is now one of, if not the biggest music retailer in the world. What is a company that has nothing to do with music distribution? What business is it of theirs? To in the course of a pretty short order, right, six to eight years, what business do they have coming in and taking over the market and essentially dictating how that market now runs? Now the major labels are in bed with them because they know that's their outlet. Um, so all that's to say, this is the wild, wild west in the music business, and I think it potentially could be in other content industries as well. So uh, if you're ahead of the curve, or even if you're just with the curve, you're ahead of a lot of people in the industry already. Uh, and I really advise you to sort of to think in, outside the box, as they say, to be innovative and to use that knowledge tap into what people want and give it to them and you'll be surprised at how uh, wonderful the results can be. So that's the end of my substantive presentation. I was uh, asked to leave some time for uh, questions, discussion, uh, and so you know, feel free. Please don't, I know it's always weird at the beginning to start asking questions, but just anything you want. It doesn't have to be about what I talked about. Uh, it can be anything. So I'll open up the floor. Sure. Totally right. 
That's a great question, and you made a couple of really great points in there. I'd just like to touch on what you said about most artists aren't aware of copyright law, or at least, at least the, the nuts and bolts of it. And it's because it's a really complex area of law. It's not, it's not like you just sit and read an article and you know what's going on. That's one of the reasons I went to law school. Um, in addition to the killing time component, the other component was I felt in my career I'd sat with lawyers and signed a bunch of contracts and they told me what everything meant and I more or less got it. Um, but at the same time, I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why this was the way it was. Why, you know, when our management would say you should only put 12 songs on the record, I didn't understand, well, that has something to do with mechanical royalties and how you can max those out um, without overreaching and save songs for later records. Suffice it to say, I didn't get it. So I went to law school to see if I could try and get it. And now I kind of get it, but I still don't fully get it, to be totally honest with you. It's a complex area. Um, in terms of how it's informed what happens with Wide Mouth Mason, I think I was skeptical when we signed a major label deal in 97 or something like that. Uh, I was really skeptical, but I didn't know what other route there was. You know, I thought this is how you, you try to make it as a band. And, and uh, in retrospect, I don't regret having done that. I think there was a lot of good things that came from it, but I know that, I'll, I know that we as a band will never sign with a major label again, I think, unless things really shift in terms of how major labels approach the industry. Um, just because, I, I'll give you an example. So we sold you know, a number of records in the heyday of our career when we were charting on radio and we were you know, a very visible band, um, relatively speaking. I didn't see a cent from a record sold. So when we had gold records, I never saw a penny from that. Now, the counter to that is, well, that's because all the money, the reason for that is because there's something called recoupable money that labels spend on, on, on marketing acts um, that then they then take back from all the money that comes in from sales, if there are any sales. Uh, so, you know, you can argue, well, that money was invested into building your career, and that's true. Um, but now having come through that and being on this end of things, I recognize that I don't need to give that money away. I can sell m m way fewer albums than I did back then and make more money off of them. <coughs> I may not have the same profile, but I do have much more control. Um, and that becomes really important, especially in artistic crafts where um, when someone else has control, it also often means they have influence on the creative output. So they can say to you, you know, we don't think you have the songs here on this record, so you've got to go make a whole bunch, write a whole bunch more songs. Um, an example of a, some friends of mine that uh, around the same time their band came out and they did extremely well, uh, then they signed with, uh, with a label in the States that we also signed with. Um, they came back with their second set of songs for their second record, and the label said, no, you know, we think you need to go back. Uh, so they went back and they came back with a third set of songs and they said, no, I think you need to go back. And that went on for seven years. Seven. They wrote 80 songs. And at the end of that process, the label said, you know what, I think we should go back to that first batch. That was probably the right one. And by that time, it was too late. By that time, they had lost whatever kind of bit of a spark they'd started to have in the States. Um, so that's all to say, you know, you're dealing with a bunch of people. There, there's no evil intent. I, you know, sometimes I, I give these talks or I just am in discussion about this stuff and it sounds like I'm, I'm very anti-major label and very anti-multinational corporations, which I am. But, <laughs> but hopefully I can see past that when we're discussing this. And, and, and look, there are lots of wonderful people that work in those companies um, and that I have great relationships with and that I enjoy working with. Um, but I think as, as an institution and as a structure, um, it, it fails to account for certain things, right? It fails to account for how to just keep a, ta a tab on what's going on. It's a follower more than it is a leader, right? So um, has anyone heard of this book called uh, The Pirate's Dilemma? It's by a guy named Matt Mason, I believe, in the States. Anyway, it, it, the, the crux of the book is that um, pirates, or youth culture, essentially is constantly um, changing and influencing in a very real and substantial way capitalism and how uh, basically just how economics works. Um, so, you know, the idea is that the pirates or, or youth culture is way ahead of the curve. They're setting the trend and everyone else is just following, including the biggest companies in the world. You know, you even look at an example like Facebook. Facebook started as what? A bunch of young people socializing with each other, right? Uh, and now, I, I defy you to find a major company in the world that doesn't have a Facebook page and doesn't try to use it to market what they're doing. So all of that's a long and circu circuitous way of saying, how has it influenced me and how I deal with Wide Mason? Well, it's made me a lot more uh, leery of dealing with the big companies, and it's made me uh, a lot more content in knowing that 
you don't need to be Justin Bieber to have a successful career in the music biz. Um, and sometimes it's a lot more fun to not be Justin Bieber. <laughs>